Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to episode 22 of MSP Business School. Today with us, we've got Jason Shaler from Anderson Zermulin, an audit and technology firm based out of Montana. Uh, of course, along with me to, uh, to have our discussion today, I've got Rob Rogers and Tim McNeil, as always, from OSR Manage. And uh, today we're gonna talk a little bit about assessments and the value of assessments, both in maintaining customer relationships, driving sales, but also really making sure that you're looking in depth to your customers and making sure that they can comply with whatever they're facing as well. So with that, I say welcome, Jason. Thank you, thanks for having me on board. You bet. Glad to have you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for coming. And for everybody, I just want to share this. Jason was nice enough to come in as a last minute pinch hitter today. So be <laughs> kind, be gentle. <laughs> He's really helping me out. We had him planned for a little bit later down the road. <laughs> well, well, since I'm a security guy, I don't know if I'm kind and gentle. <laughs> uh, no kind of gentle, brute force, of course. <laughs> So Jason, tell us a little bit about your background and then a little bit about Anderson Zimulin. Well, I've been in IT for, gosh, a little over 20 years. Um, I like to say that my career in IT has been a little um, Forrest Gumpish. I kind of just fell into things. You know, originally all I wanted to do was desktop PC and end user support and I got thrown into servers and then when I got there, I got thrown into infrastructure and and then from there, I got thrown into security. So I just happened to be at the right place at the right time with uh, you know the right mentors that helped me get through my career to bring me to where I am now. Um, for our company, you know, we're a traditional accounting company based out of Helena, Montana. Um, we The company was founded in 1957 by our two founders. And um, I don't think they ever would have thought that we'd have a technology division back then. Yeah. Yeah, seriously, right? Yeah, uh, it's it's an interesting match, right? But you know, it makes a lot of sense. I know uh, we've got a group like that out here in the Northeast, where we're all based out of. And their simple answer was, we looked at the books and we looked at what people were spending on technology companies, and it only made sense to start one. So I'm not sure if that's a similar story for you guys. Well, yeah. I mean, you have that, but I mean, if you think about it, accounting has progressed. That. There's computers, you know, you have to, you do all your accounting on computers and, um, you know, your accounting packages. So it just kind of grew into that. And then for us, you, we already have that trusted relationship with customers yeah. where we're already doing your finances and your financials and things like that, that you already trust us with that stuff. So why not bring in some experts from the computer side? And that makes sense, right? You're already in the information flow as it is, and you're looking at some of the most sensitive information. It only makes sense to keep that trusted relationship, you know, there. And certainly, uh, you know, accounting, you know, when you think about what you guys are responsible for, really, in the big scheme of things, the first things that went online were the accounting programs and the general ledger programs and ways for people to track finance. So, you know, it's kind of where it all started, too. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your role today and you know what, what you're doing within Anderson's Zermulin and uh, you know, a little bit of some of the objectives of the organization in having a technology company. Sure, so I'm in uh, Anderson's Zermulin Technology Services or what we call AZTS, um, the, we're the technology division. We have, you know, we do everything. Um, we can sell you computers, all the way up to hosting your entire network in our VDI infrastructure. Um, I actually have two roles. Uh, I have a role within the parent company of AZ, where I am basically the virtual CIO, or not virtual CIO, virtual CISO, where I run the security. So my boss on the AZTS side is my boss in AZTS, but he's my peer when it comes over to the security of the parent company. Um, <laughs> So over there, it's my job to make sure that we have our policies and procedures in place that we're protecting our data and things like that. On the consulting side, I do everything from, you know, risk audits all the way up to helping, um, you know, people build security programs to even helping the audit side of our, our uh, corporate, you know, our, the AZ side with doing IT controls for financials to SOC 2 um, certifications. 
Uh, it's an it's an amazingly deep portfolio, and it is amazing, you know, as I've gotten to learn more about you, how things, you know, your in your company, how things go hand in hand. You know, um, kind of tell us a little bit about what you're targeting and where you're trying to expand within, you know, AZTS today. I know we've talked a lot about security assessments kind of being a leader, uh, you know, for the organization. Talk a little bit about your thoughts on, on assessments as a whole and how that can tie back to the full audit process that your accounting company does. Sure, because, well. you know, I, I also have a, a banking background, so I'm used to regulated um, environments where that's really where I kind of honed in on my risk assessment stuff is that we were required to do risk assessments and understand risk and mitigate risk. So I bring that to smaller companies that just can't afford to have an IT security guy. Um, you know, I can come in and, and work with you and do a risk assessment and, and understand what's going on and have you and explain it back to you and, and just normal language. And, you know, from there, help you understand uh, where you need to move forward to secure your environment. Um, you know, one of the things that I have an advantage of is working with accountants. People, people think that that's a hard thing to do. When I actually say it's an easy thing to deal with uh, on accountants, because regardless if they're talking about counting beans and I'm talking about counting ones and zeros, we both understand a risk. It's a common language that, that the accountants can understand. And if I can explain to you why this risk exists or what this risk means to the financials of the company, um, they understand that. And it's perfectly fine. They just, sometimes they just need a little bit of help to understand the IT stuff in their language. And I find risk is a really good framework that goes across everything. Awesome. Awesome. And, and you know, it, it is interesting when you talk about the common language of risk and really that language seems to even cascade to the traditional business owner here in 2020, right? You know, accountants always were dealing with financial risk and fiduciary risk early on. Obviously, IT adopted security risk and protection of IP and data. But now with some of the new regulations that are out there that and publicly traded companies could even come with jail time, you're seeing the rank and file on the business side of life really saying, you know, how do we mitigate this risk? How do we make sure we're at least doing our due diligence and what we're supposed to, to ensure that if we had to prove out a breach that we weren't being egregious and, and just right. ignoring it, right? So um, it's interesting, um, you know, how those things have kind of all tied together as time's gone on. Now, you know, from my seat, one of the things I noticed, and Tim and Rob, I'd be interested to hear what you're seeing with some of the customers that you work with too. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people out there today kind of hanging a shingle out there and saying that they're a managed security company. And in a lot, you know, an MSSP, right? And a lot of times those MSSPs, while they are bringing security tools out there, it's just that they're bringing the tools out and they're bringing the foundational skills, dark web scans, you know, your firewalls, yeah. your switches, mm -hmm. but they don't really have what I would term as a governance process around this or the controls around this to know that they're actually getting the data in and that they're really doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but that's an area where you guys really focus in on as well in the world of AZTS, correct? It is. You know, I just had an engagement with a, a, with a customer that they have an MSP who actually competes against us as an MSP. Um, so yeah, they bring me in as an independent consultant. And when I did my risk assessment and vulnerability scanning and, and things like that, we found some things out where their, their MSP was not, they say they were doing things, mm -hmm. but the evidence was showing that they may not have understood what they were doing. Um, sure the, the border was secure, but they didn't really understand vulnerability management as a whole. They understood patch management which, you know, their idea of patch management is simply just the Windows patches. But when you go through the vulnerability scanning, it goes deeper into that to the misconfiguration of the operating system or the third party patches. Uh, this was uh, an engineering firm. We found vulnerabilities on their CAD machines from AutoCAD that, you know, they're not Windows patches. So there's things where some of these MSSPs you know, they bring the thing in, they bring it in, and, you know, they were showing patch reports, we're patching, we're patching, we're patching, but they didn't understand that 
you know, patching is one thing, vulnerability management is something completely different. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, and, and Brian, I, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think the, the MSSP side is very similar to the MSP side from the standpoint that, I mean, one, it's in the whole scheme of things, it's a newer industry, right? So yeah. people say they're MSSPs, but there's a lot of people that say they're MSPs and they're not really, right? Well, yeah, so that, that, that's, that has existed forever, yeah. <laughs> right? But I think what you're, you know, what, I, what I'm hearing you say too, Tim, is the MSSP world right now is almost like it was for the MSP world going back to the mid 2000s yeah. when yes. everybody was just getting in yeah. and doing some monitoring and really trying to figure out what this was about and, you know, I look at it and when we got into monitoring, it was the coolest thing ever. And then we got right. the alerts. Look, we told you there was a problem, but it took years for people to really go, but now what do we want to do? How do we want to triage it? What does this really mean? And how do we want to get out in front of it long term? I think we're kind of at that same inflection point with the MSSPs where they're doing a good job of getting the right tools out there, but they're not yet mature enough to do the things that, uh, you know, Jason's responsible for within his practice. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I think that's part of the the main difference. Like if like before all this COVID stuff came about, would Timmy and I would go to trade so trade shows, you would see fifty percent of the booths would be an outsourced MSSP opportunity for you. And like when the MSP brings that in, they're not real. It's all that change right now that's going on. That you know you, you're you're trying to outsource part of your business, but if you don't have somebody inside the business that is an employee of yours that understands you know the top one percent that's where everything starts getting like, uh oh, right? It starts getting to that gray area where I'm sure that MSP that you were just talking about, Jason, really think that they're doing a very good job on the vulnerability assessment, but they're not because they're either outsourcing it to a third party that they think has it all covered or you know, they, they just don't know what they don't know. And, and that's the problem that we're running into right now with the MSPs trying to bring in this MSSP side. Uh, if they don't bring it in house, it, there's some growing pains coming our way. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I know this MSP, uh, they've been around for a while. Um, it's, uh, they, they're at the point where they don't know what they don't know yet. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, yeah. they're thinking MSP and throwing and bolting security onto the MSP and they don't have really a security expert that's mm -hmm. driving that is. part. So, you yeah. know, they're, I think they got a they got a quick lesson from this customer when you know they the customer gave that report to them and they were like oh um, and they were changing I could see the reports coming back and and the the communications coming back to the customer they were literally changing their practice on the fly oh yeah based off oh. of my findings so I not yeah. surprised by that at all I, I mean no, you see that no, like yeah, like that's just surprised me in the least yeah. You know, the other thing that, um, you know, I think as the MSSPs evolve, what they really have to realize, and it does go back to the security talent that everybody's been referencing on, on the show today, you've got to have an incident response team too. It's one thing to be able to detect. It's another thing to be able to use tools to identify where there's vulnerabilities. But at the end of the day, you've got to get out in front of the incident. You've got to be able to identify where the breach is and you've got to be able to triage and stop, right? Short of unplugging the, the servers from the wall, so to speak, you've got to do something. And that's the real art form in security. And that's where the real top level high end security specialists make their money. And, you know, I know a couple of MSSPs that went from zero to 2 million last year, just on based on in, incident response capability. Yep. You know, it was, it was such a key niche that they were able to partner with a lot of MSSPs. And basically anytime those guys, I won't say drop the ball, but found a problem, it would allow them to step in and really resolve it. You're kind of the front end of that spectrum though, right, Jason, where you're really going in and kind yeah. of making sure that the controls are there to try to stave off and mitigate the risk of having that incident response piece absolutely i'm i'm more on the prevention side than the response side uh when i worked for the bank we had to do you know i had to sit on both sides uh it was I, i'll tell you incident response is something that you really need to specialize in um it was something that you know I, it was fun but it was it's it's not my thing i'm much more of a prevention person than than a response person 
No, that's uh, that makes all the sense in the world, right? Because mm -hmm. if you can lock the doors before the burglar gets in, it's a lot easier than fighting the burglar in the middle of the night with your baseball bat and your boxer shorts, right? So, exactly, uh, exactly. <laughs> I love to paint the picture, right. don't I? Where the hell did uh, that come from? <laughs> all right, okay, all right. And with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know how it is here. But all, but all kidding aside here, you know, you know taking, taking that approach a little bit, you know, I'd like to get your opinion on this, Jason, because this was something interesting I found when I was running data centers. So we were undergoing, you know, my, my time, time frame, it was the SSA, uh, the SAS 70, then it became the SSA 16 and SOC 2. And one of the things that always interested me is we'd go through our prep process, which was really going through the audit and identifying where the gaps were and then building our controls. Then we would submit our measured controls to our CPA firm at the end of the six months. And they would analyze whether or not our controls said what they did. But what was not analyzed, and again, I'll take this down in the gutter for a moment, if my controls sucked. So mm -hmm. the reality was it was basically, you know, I was basically being unassessed that I've identified controls and I'm measuring them the way I'm supposed to be measuring them and we're getting the results we think we're, we should but that doesn't mean that the results are really right. So how does an accounting firm like yours or an audit firm like yours try to help in that process? Because I always felt like I was left with a little bit of a gap, even though I satisfied my, my, my need, you know what I mean? For at least from a marketing level. <laughs> so, so I'm going to, I'm going to back up a little bit and I'm going to say, this is my personal opinion it does not reflect that of the industry I'm in or my sure. employer. Um, SOC, you know, SOC 2 certification was a step in the right, in the right direction. Um, you know, is it the end all be all? No, it's not. Because it's all based off of um, management's description. So the way I describe my controls is what you're going to order, uh, you're going to audit me on. Now, coming out of that is, and I haven't had a chance to really dig into it yet, is now SOC for cybersecurity. So AI, I think AICPA realized that there's a, there's a problem with that. It's like, yes, we have this. This was a really huge step forward, became a great standard, but there's a, there's a weakness in there and that's coming out with the SOC for cybersecurity. Um, and like I said, I haven't had a chance to brush up on that yet, but I'm hoping that that's gonna be the, the gap filler on that because you know, I had a discussion with a customer last week where they were looking at going forward with uh, a, a SOC 2 and they wanted us to come in and do the, you know, the, the prep work. We weren't going to do the certification. Our, they wanted us to help them get ready to do a SOC 2. And, you know, talking to that customer, they were not ready at all. Um, they're, they're probably two years away from even being to that point where they can request a SOC. Um, and I was explaining that to them. They're like, well, wait, so this password, you know, we have this password policy of two years, um, you know, because we have this customer who only, log they, their people only log in every two years. If we expire the password every 90 days, then that's going to, that's going to flag on an audit. And I'm like, no, not exactly because you're going to describe that in your management description that we do this to help this customer out there and all that stuff. I go, he goes, but then, you know, that's not a, that's not a standard. I go, no, that's SOC. SOC is what you, what you explain your controls to be. It's up to the reader of your SOC to decide whether or not those controls are appropriate for the data that you're going to house for them. And, you know, those are, those are some, some of the issues are out there that, you know, they need to be, they need to be addressed. And I explained to them, I go, look, we, I can explain that, uh, you know, in a, in a management description, that's easily explained. Um, now, if you want to do, you know, two year password, I would probably recommend a multi-factor authentication to be put on top of that. And, you know, that could be explained away in the new NIST guidance for passwords. And then you're still following a standard. Yep. Yeah. And, and, you know, what you've really illustrated there, Jason, is this is why, you know, these assessments and these control things are really kind of need to be done by the specialist. It's not as easy as just saying, we're going to go out and do and buy a tool and conduct this assessment. You've got to understand the real impact 
and the drivers behind each one of these regulations. Because, you know, when you talk about something like, well, we don't need to have a password, ex you know, expiration policy, you'd have a lot of people in the traditional MSP space arguing with you explicitly, even though you've got the MFA layer, and that's part of the reason it was put there, to kind of identify you personally and then identify you credentially, right? And it takes a little bit of the onus off. And those are little nuances that I know that your group really specializes in and your auditors really understand. Yeah, I mean, and like that whole understanding the new NIST guidance, you know, I had another customer, they, they went to a no password. Uh, I was doing a financial IT controls. They have no password changes. And they're like, this is, I was like, why, why are you not changing passwords? And they go, well, NIST guidance says, that, you know, right, you know, this leads to writing passwords down and stuff like that. And I go, I understand that, but you didn't read the entire guidance. I go, if you're going to do this, you need to have some type of multi-factor authentication attached to it. And they're like, oh, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you, you, you can I, About that. If, if you said that I'm okay with it, then I, I'm, I'm fine with this as an IT control to protect your financials, but you didn't read the standard correctly. And now this is a finding on this audit. You know, this was a financial audit. Um, you guys need to address this really quickly. <laughs> So um, we're getting near the end of our episode here. So we usually do a couple of things, Jason, but before I go into those final things that we do to kind of close out our, our meeting today, one thing I do want to make aware is MSPs, if you guys are out there and you're really trying to help your customers prep for an audit or that your customer's not sure how to undergo an audit, uh, AZ is a group you can engage with, you know, and, and, I, and I'm sales pitching for you here, Jason, but it's real, you know, because one of the things that I know is a challenge is some of our MSPs MSPs don't know how to engage CPAs or their existing accounting relationships don't specialize in IT controls. They're maybe more financial based. So certainly uh, Anderson Zumulin and I will put the uh, URL in our show notes for today as well is somebody that you can engage with and you can reach out to Jason directly and he can give you some guidance as well because, you know, as you've already evidenced here, you work with those MSP partners to help their customers get where they need to be. Uh, we partnered back when I was a data center with a, a SOC 2 specialist and, you know, it helped both sides, uh, both us as a company, but also helped us in our sales process. So I just wanted to put that out there. To close things out, Jason, we usually do a couple of things. One thing we always look to understand is, hey, how are you maintaining work-life balance, especially today in COVID times? And then we're going to hit you with five quick questions. Sure. So the work-life balance has been a, a core thing for AZ for a long time. Um, we with us especially having the hosting side where we do vdi um, when COVID hit it wasn't that big of a deal i mean it, it was a big deal but it, it didn't impact us as as much because we already had people working from home um you know during the accounting season it's you know accountants are working long hours so then if the loans are getting the work done whether they're doing it in the office at home no one really cared as long as they got the work done they were meeting with their customers and all that um, so it, it really didn't hit us, hit us that hard with trying to do that big swing of all of a sudden we have a remote workforce. Um, you know, also being a traditional accounting firm, we have these people called auditors. Auditors are in the field all the time. You know, they're, they're not paid to be in the office to look over tax returns. They're out there to actually audit books and stuff like that. So accounting firms are naturally used to being in the field anyway. So it, it it wasn't that big of a deal. And um, so we'll close out now with our speed round questions. Anybody want to take that or shall I rattle them off? Yeah, I'll take them. I'll take All them. right, Tim. All right. So the first one is talk, text, or teams. I would still say text. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Music, movies, or TV. Uh, music. Okay. What age do you want to retire? Uh, five years ago. Five. <laughs> uh, 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 that's a new one. Good. Uh, uh, Mac or Windows? Uh, Mac. Okay. Really? Yeah. You're the first one. You are the first. We've had a and couple. Uh, who would have thought it an accountant side of life? Or yeah. An yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Is that the security side, I wonder? Uh, yeah, it's I, the security side. Trust, trust me, when I went Mac uh, a few years ago, I was heavily credentialed in Windows for my career. And my friends 
told me, they go, Microsoft just called once, once all your certifications back. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Last one is if you could do anything outside of tech, what would that be? Anything outside of tech? I think I'd want to run a dog rescue. Oh, very so, nice. Oh, that's oh, awesome. Very cool. Oh, very cool. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So, Rob, Tim, anything you want to close out with for today? Any closing thoughts? Uh, no, hey, no, I think I that think was, so. yeah, I'm good on my yeah, side for sure. Appreciate you, awesome. appreciate you joining us today. 100%. Uh, Jason, yeah, it was great having yeah, you. Yeah, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be on. Yeah. yeah, Jason, I really uh, appreciate you coming on here. I hope uh, our listeners today got to learn a little bit more about really what the necessity for assessments are and part of the reason that they're important to your clients, especially those that are regularly regulatory bound. Uh, yeah. I'll get that out later. Yeah. And uh, you definitely again, don't want your clients on the wall of shame, the HHS wall of shame. No. <laughs> yep. And again, guys, I'll put in the show notes how you can get in touch with Jason and the folks over at Anderson Zermulin so you can... Uh, you know, if you need some assistance, if you need, if your customer's looking at how to get certified, you know, whether it's a SOC 2, whether it's a, a another NIST standard or a HIPAA report, you know, those kind of things, they can help you out on that. Jason, you have anything else you want to add before we break? No, I, you know, I just want to say, you know, thank you for the opportunity to be on. Even, you know, if it was last minute, I was, I was happy that I could get on and I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, we appreciate you helping us totally out today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no man. problem. Yeah. Um, with right. that, folks, remember, you can always get this episode over at mspbusinessschool.com. That's where our show notes will be, so you can get links to, to talk to Jason. And, of course, you can get it on uh, Apple, Stitcher, and anywhere else that you get all your podcasts. So thank you very much for joining us this week, and we'll see you next.